I completely blew up my whole watercolor collection. Okay, so this is the video that everyone's been waiting for. Do you like how I say everyone? Like nobody's been asking me for this video. <laughs> but I'm giving it to you anyway. This is the video where I'm gonna take you through my updated organization and storage um, system for how I organize my entire watercolor collection. So if you first watched my video two years ago about how I organize my watercolors, I was primarily a tube girl. And since then I have completely overhauled everything. So if you're new to my channel, um, I feel like I'm saying this over and over again, but I am a mom, uh, now a mom of two. I have two businesses, I have this YouTube channel. It is like survival mode, <laughs> survival mode activated. Uh, it is, it's crazy in the Margot household. So, which means that I have to be super organized. I always have to be super organized. I want to be super organized, but I have to be organized with how I, how I manage all my supplies so I know where everything is because I'm not one of those people who buy stuff and then like lets it collect dust in a drawer somewhere. I need to, and I want to use everything that I have. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. I'm gonna be sharing with you my um, watercolor system and setup for both my personal and my professional projects. I'm gonna be showing you how I do my swatch cards, which has also completely changed. I will show you my some of my really cool new toys in the studio. Um, yeah, there's a lot to go through. So without further ado, I feel like this is gonna be a cool, sh cool. This is gonna be so cool. Um, this is gonna be a show and tell. So let's get started and let me show you what I've got. All right, desk time. So first things first, I wanna talk a little bit about my swatch organization system. So last time I did a video about how I organized my swatches. I used to keep them in this small box library card kind of container. Since then, my watercolor collection has really increased exponentially. And so that just wasn't enough to hold all that. So I get a lot of free product, I get uh, manufacturers sending me their latest creations, that kind of thing. And so I really felt like I needed a bigger system to organize everything. So with that said, let me start with the first binder, which is how I keep my general, not my swatches quite yet, but how I keep my color uh, what do you call it? Like an overview of, of colors from different brands. What I do is all the chip charts and dot cards that I've purchased. And you'll have seen on this channel that I've done unboxings where I've purchased like these dot cards from brands like Daniel Smith or like Schmincke, that kind of thing. And so I will put these dot cards in this binder so that I can quickly see an overview of the entire range from a brand. And for brands where I actually don't have a chip chart from them, what I do is I grab the, the chip chart from the from the internet and then print it on my own paper. So this is, for example, Sennelier, which I was able just to just print on my inkjet printer. And then here I hand painted my own swatches from my own collection. So as you can see, you have the whole range. And I did the same thing for, let's see, like I've got a gallo right here. And for brands where it's incomplete, like I obviously have like little blank spots where you can fill in what I don't yet have. And another thing that I have started doing as well, so this is Daniel Smith, Windsor and Newton. I'm planning on printing out the pigment information for, for every brand. So this is Windsor and Newton that provides theirs on their website. So I printed that out. So if I want a overview of what the pigments are, um, in the in the range. If you're not familiar with the pigment labeling system and how that whole thing works, I have a really cool video where I have a ton of fun about how you know how, how all that stuff works, how that jargon works, all these different attributes and components from paints, and how that's broken down in a really really simple, manageable way for most people. Because I know how how really overwhelming it can be to like look at all this information and be like, well, that's a lot. So, so yeah, so this is, um, these are the pigment codes, pigment information, the properties of uh, Windsor and Newton in particular. And I'm going to do that, like I said, to, for, for everything. Oh, and uh, M. Grand, for example. So if, like, this is just extra information. If you are planning on doing something similar, if you have a chart, like something like this, where it doesn't really make much sense to hole punch on it, what I do is I just tape it onto an extra piece of card and then punch holes through that so that I can pull it out of my binder and have ta -da, the <laughs> the whole range like this, and not have to you know, have unsightly holes going through the pamphlet. Way too much information than me necessarily needed, but this is like I said, a deep dive into my whole 
really crazy organizational bender. Um, so yeah, so this is the first binder, which is overview binder. And then we get into the swatches. And this method I actually got, not from myself, I didn't invent this, but I got from you artists who um, on other videos that I did were, were talking about how you organize your supplies. And a lot of people use this method. And I was like, that's really cool. I should, I should do it the same way, which is to have all your chips in these business card sleeves. So what I do is I just took all my cards from previously and I cut them up and I just put them in, in, in here. So this is great because it just it allows you to just have everything, like an overview of everything and not have to like search for individual colors. I do know that people, some people do baseball cards, but I don't know, I feel like baseball cards are too big. And if you're not in the US and you're like, what are baseball cards? It's kind of like it's collector cards, Pokemon cards, baseball cards, whatever. They're usually larger, but business cards I find to be like convenient enough so that you can fit a lot on a page. So you don't have like a ginormous binder, which this already is a ginormous binder of colors. I do have a, I wanted to answer a question that somebody was asking me recently in the comments about why is it I have a white ring or a white border around my swatches? That's a really good question. And this is like a matter of personal preference here. How I like to think about it is that the white frame around helps to give me an isolation of the color. So I feel like when I have a color, let me try to find two, two swatches. So we're looking at them apples to apples. For example, find something. Okay, so here, for example, a gallows vermilion red. So initially I did a swatch like this and I find that you don't really get to see the pop of color like you do against white. Like a, a white ground gives you a reference point for how that color functions like in the context of a white background. Whereas this one, when it's bleeding off the page, I feel like if you're just holding it up, you, you can, it can, it can get, um, skewed by what 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 your background is so if i'm looking at it like on a, on a table or or whatnot obviously if you have a piece of white paper then that, that'll achieve the same thing as this but i feel like this is a quicker way of looking in a binder or you know individual swatches and being able to see the color really pop and rise off the page whereas this one i feel like it's you don't really see that contrast as well I don't know. Let me know what you think. If you see, if you're seeing it the same way as, as I do, tons of people do it this way. I've seen other YouTubers, uh, Anna Bucciarelli, for example, comes to mind. She has swatches like this. Nothing wrong with it. It's just like the artist's preference. I happen to like it this way. I happen to find it just easier, easier for me to see. So yeah. So going back to the swatches, I like to put the light fast information on it. The not light fast. This is the transparency. I do put light fast rating as well as my pigment codes on there. But honestly, when I'm looking for colors, I kind of don't care. I do primarily printed artwork. So judging something based on light fastness alone is not something that's super important to me, unless I'm obviously selling a commissioned original, then yes, absolutely. Want to be bulletproof for that. But I'm not somebody who's just going to be like, no, no, don't do like a fugitive color. I will choose whatever it takes to get it to print to be exactly what my, my color is. And I do mugs, I do t-shirts, I do, I do everything. Okay. Lots of words. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. So yeah, so these are my, my way of organizing my swatches. Next up is the big thing, which is how I set up and organize my palettes. And so if you were watching my studio organizational video from like, I think it was two years ago, you will have known that I was at the time primarily a tube watercolor person. So I operated mostly with tubes just because that was my preference. Now things have changed because I am really just trying to be very, very efficient when it comes to my workflow because being an at-home mom and working, not having childcare, um, I have to constantly go back and forth between kids, me, feeding someone, diaper, coming back, project, emailing something. So it's like, it's a lot. So the biggest priority for me right now is being able to set up within literally a second and not waste any time with the prep before I start painting. So that's number one. And secondly is my color collection is very large. So again here, I like to own a lot of different colors because the nature of what I do, I do a lot of custom, I do a lot of 
projects for brands, I need to have a range of watercolors that fits a lot of different styles. I am always chameleoning between different styles, different subject matters. Sometimes a client will come to me and they're looking for a very, very specific green and they'll come to me in February for that green and they'll come back to me in November later that year or the following year and they'll want the exact same green. So I need to be able to have a lot of convenience colors. I need to be able to have colors and paints that have different properties, some that are very, um, that, that move very fast in water for like an ink kind of effect. I need granulars, I need transparents, I need a lot of different things. And to give you an idea, like I had somebody recently want to commission me for something that's inspired by Jasper Johns. Then I had somebody who wanted to do an interior design commission, like a watercolor of something in Italy. I'm doing Christmas and holiday stuff for my own personal collection. I'm doing pastels, I'm doing neons, I'm doing a lot of things. So to be able to you know, tackle all these different things and not lose my mind, having to mix everything all the time, having a very, very broad collection is something that has worked a lot for me in my process. So that is a lot. Let me, let me show you exactly what I mean. Okay, so this is how I used to organize my watercolors. This is gouache, mind you, uh, because my watercolor tubes are in a drawer in storage, but um, this is exactly how I used to do it. So I used to have all of my tubes organized like this with the lids facing up and I had the paint swatches on the lids or the caps of every single one of my tubes. And what I used to do is that I would have a palette designated for client A, and I would squeeze whatever colors I wanted onto that palette and keep that palette for the duration of that project. And so I would put like a little post-it note or something like that, which told me who this was for, and each client had a palette for them. But recently, <laughs> again, when you have two kids running around and, um, and it's kind of chaotic at home to, come in here and pick things out and squeeze them onto a palette and, and yada, 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 is um, it, it just, it's an extra step. So what I've started doing is I started to squeeze out all of my paints into designated palette tins per brand. So this is what it looks like. This is kind of a small sampling. So what I do is I have these palettes. These are by the brand, I think, Meaden. Uh, that I get from Amazon. I'll link that below if you're interested in the way that I set it up. And what I'll do is I'll take a piece of artist tape and put it on the side here, which tells me what, what's inside. So Windsor & Newton, Sennelier, Core, Gouache, Bento Box is kind of like a mix bag. It's a little bit of everything, it's a sprinkling of my favorites. Based on my ultimate palette setup, which if you haven't seen yet, that's on my channel and I will put it right here in the card above. I have everything squeezed out from this collection in here with my chips. And if you'll notice, my chips are kind of funny looking. I did not, I don't have one individual card where I paint everything on it. Actually, let me show you. This, this is something that I did a while back, again on this channel, my Sennelier swatching video. This is how I used to swatch. And so this is a, a pre-made palette that I bought from the brand Sennelier. And what I did here is I, I painted everything onto one, onto one card. But being kind of like the, somebody who doesn't like to be pigeonholed into something like a specific setup. Like I like to be very flexible. I figured that I like the system where instead of, there's a little bit of tape there. Instead of having everything painted on one chart, I paint my, my swatches on individual chips so that if let's say I get, I grow tired of lemon yellow or something else, comes on the scene, I want to replace lemon yellow with something else. I can pop the swatch off and replace it with another one. And so these become much more modular. And even if I want to change my setup and move my yellows, I don't know, if I feel like the mood, I'm in the mood to change things up, then I can move things around my palette and just move these chips around and not have to redo the whole chart or become totally confused because I don't know what color is where on my chart. So that is how I've been doing it. I feel like it's been working really well for me. I don't know. Yeah, it works. It works for me. And I always like to say for artists, like you, you do what works for you. Like you could look at a YouTuber or somebody who's like, this is a, this is the most amazing system ever. If it doesn't work for you, like ignore it. Trust your gut, trust your instincts. You know way more than you think you do. So, so yeah, so that's how I do it. So I have one for Sennelier. I have my bento box collection, which is a lot of different people, different brands in one. Oh, M gram is different. M gram, I have this, I have this on my table, but M gram I keep in my fridge. <laughs> but again, the same thing here. Like I have my little labeling system, M gram. So when I started doing this, I found that I very rarely like to work. Oh, 
Uh, crisis averted. Uh, I very rarely like to use the entire range of my watercolor paints because what easily happens is you can kind of start getting a rainbow effect, which I do not like at all. Meaning like when you're using too many colors, you don't mix enough and you don't have that cohesion that, that is true to when you, when you mix more of your colors from a more limited palette. So what I started doing, this is like, this is all stuff made to help me in my process so that I don't go crazy, which you know what? It's too late. So I have this little palette. I found this via Etsy. Um, this is a amazing art supply maker. The name of the company is Arts to Embers and it's run by this, this really great guy. His name is Zach. And I'm not being paid for this, by the way. None of this is, is like being paid or sponsored by anybody. When I talk about art materials and I recommend them really, really strongly, sometimes people say, oh my gosh, you're getting a kickback from this. I am not. I like this guy, this is his livelihood. And so when I find amazing products like this by individuals who have a passion for helping artists and who make really cool products, I get super excited. So it might sound like I'm being like paid to do this. I am not. This is coming from my heart and the fact that I really love what this guy makes. So he 3D prints these palettes, these bespoke palettes. They come in half pans, they come in full pans, they come in um, 12, six sets, 72 sex sets. I think this, he has 150 or 160 sets. I mean, it's, it's amazing, a huge broad range. And I'll show you some of my other palettes from him in a second. But what I like to do to limit my palette, when I start a project, just pull out the paints that I'll be using. Oops, stick them in here. So let's say I decided to go all blues or something. And you might have seen this also in some of my tutorials where I have like this very small palette. And I will close this, ignore, and just work from that. And so what this does, it puts blinders on me. So I don't feel like I'm tempted to go chasing some other colors over here and I can stay really, really laser focused into a limited palette based on like my selection. So this has really, really helped with being able to manage a larger collection of watercolors and not let it get out of hand and, and, and totally crazy with with the colors and, and, and it fall apart for that reason. So yes, that is this is Arts to Embers with a smaller, this is the 12 palette. Let me show you his 72 palette. I just got that from my Daniel Smith collection, which is getting bigger. I'm trouble. This is my Daniel Smith collection. Look at this. How cool is that? I just love this. And what I love about this too, and I didn't, don't think I mentioned it on the small pan, but they're all the same, is that you can really easily pop them out. Like you don't have the, so like for this, we have like the metal little prongs that you have to like open up to, to get it out. For these ones, they're just sitting in there. So if your paints are dry, you can just pop them out like that. Just super easy. And oh, one more thing. Again, like I'm, I feel like I'm just like being, <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm doing an infomercial for Embers to Arts to Embers. But um, one other thing I really love about these palettes, and I noticed that as I was starting to paint with them, is that whereas these kinds of palettes have the paints jutting up against each other, these ones have a little margin of separation. It's very, very subtle, but that little extra gutter between each color helps with being able to keep your colors from cross-contaminating. And I'm saying that pointing to two colors that have been massively cross-contaminated, not because of the palettes, but because I'm a slob when it comes to mixing my colors. And I, I like mud, I like muddy colors. That's just me. But um, but yeah, having that extra, like extra room in between really helps with with giving each color their, their necessary space in between each of them. So yeah, so this is a 72. I believe the 151 is like, I think it's like a double decker, like those jewelry boxes where you like, super cool. I'm getting ideas. No, don't buy more, Margot. You have too much. Um, some people collect shoes. I collect watercolors. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I get too excited. So yeah, so that's that's Arts to Embers and his delightful watercolor palettes. So let's put that back in. And if you decide to go this route. Word of, word of wisdom, make sure you label your, your, your pan so that you know where everything goes. So when you put it back, it is not complete and utter disaster. You can figure out where everything goes. Just a little, little tip there for you, because if it's your first time doing this, I want to save you a bad experience of you know, having, a, having a, a tough time figuring out what goes where. 
So those are the pads. Um, what else? Oh, Roman Schmal. Yes, that's the only one that's a little bit different from these. I am um, migrating all of my, my watercolors to these types of setups. I, I, honestly, I love this. Over, over time, I think I'm just going to end up replacing everything with, with this because it's just so amazing. But Roman Schmal is different because his pans are different. They are not the standard pans, which makes me wonder. I wonder if I could contact Zach and get him to make me a custom palette. I'm so over the top. But um, recently, actually, I contacted him because I ordered a palette for him for Kuretake uh, pans. And my mother bought the Kuretakes from Japan. But when he when he shipped his palette to me, for some reason, the sizing was a little bit different. And I don't know if it's because the US Kuretake or the stuff that's made for export is different from Japan. But I contacted him and I was like, you know, the pans from Japan are not fitting inside your palettes. And he said, you know what, send it back to me. I'll measure it out for you and I'll, and I'll correct it for you, which is uh, unbelievable. I mean, it's so cool. So I actually wonder if you could maybe make me a Roman Schmal palette. But for the, for, the, for the time being, this has been serving its purpose. So I actually took my gouache set from Caran out of this box and it has been working pretty well. Things still kind of you know, come off because I'm using magnets on the bottom to keep them in. But this is where I keep my Roman Schmal collection uh, because it is arguably one of my largest. This and Daniel Smith are my largest collections of watercolors. This, Daniel Smith, and then M. Graham. And then I think I'm, 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 I'm on the fence about Michael Harding. Oof, another another topic. I'm such a bad influence, you guys. I'm so sorry. Um, again, this is my, my 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 obsession. I am I'm the Imelda Marcos of watercolors. So so yeah. So this is Roman Schmal again with my chip chart. When I when I started doing these swatches or these like modular swatches, I realized that I don't like it when it's edge to edge. Again, here you see it's like I feel like when you have a little white. A little white frame around it, it helps you to see the colors a little bit better. What do you think? I think that this is better. This is working better for me. And um, I have a video also, I'm like in 20, I'm caffeinated, I'm in 20 different directions right now because I'm so excited about sharing all this stuff with you. Um, but I have a video about my top favorite, I forget the number, is it eight, 10? My favorite unexpected art supplies. And one of them is this very special kind of hole puncher that punches out cards in the sizes of these little swatches. And so if you are interested in doing this kind of setup, buying one of those tiny little, I'll show, just check out the video. I'm gonna, I'm gonna link it either below or in the card right here so you can check it out. But it's, a, it's instead of uh, punching out a hole, like a, a binder hole, it punches out a small square about that size and so you don't have to like literally cut out every single one of them it's if, if you're planning on doing something like this you can just cut it out or, or just um uh punch it out with that with that hole puncher is that it i believe that's it only last thing i wanted to mention was this uh because i get so many questions about it this little guy this brush holder it is not actually a brush holder it is a soap holder this is another one of those uh, pieces that was, that was on my unexpected art supplies unexpected non-art supplies supplies that's what it is non-art supplies supplies this is actually a yeah it's a soap dish that i saw being advertised somewhere i think it was on cnn or something and i saw it and i was like you know that would make the perfect brush holder and because it is made for soap nothing gets um, gets ruined. It's not made of wood. It's, you know, it's washable and you have these little uh, rubber feet here for grip, for traction. So you're not gonna have like this sliding all over the place and it fits everything. Oops, <laughs> so excited. Everything, so even my largest, what is this? This is a Raphael 803? No, six. It's a number six, not an 803. What even is that? You know, even that, just goes on there really well. And um, because it is not tilted upwards, so a lot of brush holders are like tilted upwards, which is really bad for your brushes. And the reason for being bad for your brushes is that you don't want water sitting here in the silver part, the ferrule of your brush, because that's where, um, that's where all the glue and the crimping of the hairs are being held. So when water enters there, it starts to like get moist and, um, and humid and starts to deteriorate. 
And if you leave your brushes to dry like this, gravity will pull your water down this way and it'll sit there and it will ruin your brush over time. So if you are looking for a brush rest, even if you don't decide to do this, try to find one that keeps it perfectly flat. So the water has the opportunity to dry when it's still in the hairs of the, the bristles of the brush and not being pulled down towards the, the handle of the brush. Little pro tip there for you. So I hope you enjoyed this video and it gave you some ideas for how to organize your watercolor supplies. And you might not own as many watercolors as I do, and I really hope you don't because like, I have a problem. I got 99 problems and <laughs> never mind. So, so yeah, so hopefully you enjoyed this and you know, if anything, it gave you some ideas for how to improve your workflow and maybe be a little bit more efficient when you're, when you're working, whether it's with the chips, whether it's with how you keep your um, watercolors, how you store them and whatnot. And if you enjoyed this video, but you are more in the tube camp, I have a really fun video about how to keep your tubes organized in a way that is super efficient and um, that will save you tons of time. So I'm gonna put it right here so you can check that out. In the meantime, um, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next art video.